The mission of the church is not simply to go into the world and preach the gospel so that individuals can be saved out of a dying world. Uh, the mission of the church is to preach the gospel, to exalt Jesus as king. And by doing that, the church begins to share in Jesus' reign over the world. The church's mission is to uh, pilot the world, pilot the nations. Jesus, of course, is the chief pilot. He's the greater Noah who's constructed an ark. He's reconstructing the world. He's rebuilding the world. And he's the one who pilots that ship uh, through the dangerous waters of this world and pilots that ship until it comes to a new creation. But we participate in that. And this is, this is evident in a number of ways in the New Testament. Uh, one of the subtle ways that it's evident is looking at the, the way that uh, the book of Acts uh, records the itinerary of the missionaries that are sent out in, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the book of Acts. Um, there's a great, a great amount of detail is given to the various stops that Paul makes in, in places around the Mediterranean. He starts out from Antioch and then he goes, on, uh, goes sailing and he stops here and he stops there and he stops there. M many of these places are very unfamiliar to us unless we happen to look at a map. But the reason why Luke is doing that, the reason why Luke is informing us of that, is to link Paul's journeys up with earlier journeys in the Bible, and particularly with the journeys of Abraham through the land. When Abraham first entered the land, he went through the land uh, setting up altars, establishing worship in the land, and he also walked around the land, uh, walked around kind of the perimeter of the land the way somebody would before they're purchasing a piece of property. You want to scope out the perimeter of the land. You want to know what you're getting. By walking across the land, the land is becoming under his feet. He's taking dominion of that land. It's a kind of shadowy dominion in the time of Abraham. It's not yet, it doesn't yet belong to him. But that shadowy dominion, just the scoping out and uh, his feet treading over the land establishes the claim on the land that is later fulfilled in the conquest of Joshua when the Lord actually gives the land over into the hands of Abraham's descendants. That's what Paul's doing, except Paul's doing it on a much larger scale. Paul is not walking around Judea. He's not walking around Jerusalem. Paul is sailing around the Mediterranean, eventually to Rome. We don't know possibly as far as, uh, as Spain. We don't know how far Paul got. But as he's sailing, he's uh, marking out the zone of his, uh, of his domain, the zone of the world that he is going to pilot along with other believers under the pilot, Jesus Christ. We see this more specifically, more concretely in various places in the book of Acts. Whenever Paul goes into a new city, uh, he proclaims the gospel. He challenges the powers that reign in that city. By challenging those powers, he provokes those powers. If he, uh, if he challenges the uh, idol worship of a particular city, those who worship idols are going to react. If he challenges the Jews who have rejected their Messiah, the Jews are going to react. Uh, that's spiritual warfare. That's warfare against Satan. That's what Paul does every time that he goes into a city. But he's, he constantly wins those battles. Uh, Paul and the early apostles win the battles, the spiritual battles that they have in various places along their mission route. That's a spiritual battle, but it's also a political battle. At each place that Paul stops, he leaves behind an altered political landscape. Sometimes that simply means that the church has a foothold in, uh, in that city. For example, in Philippi, uh, Paul refuses to go out of the city until there's a kind of public apology on the part of the city leaders. And that public apology includes and involves recognition of the community that Paul had been working with, recognition of the Christian community. Paul leaves Philippi with a church inside. That's a different kind of world. That's a different Philippi than when he came. If there is no church, then Philippi can be uh, he can uh, can can be ruled by uh, by uh, uh, the emperor. They can they can be thoroughly Roman as Roman as they like to be. Once you get a church in there, you've got an alternative culture that's growing, and you have an altered political landscape. Sometimes Paul actually takes the place of some advisor or powerful person in a city. That he has, at the beginning of his first missionary journey in Acts 13, uh, he appears before Sergius Paulus, and there's there's a an advisor. There's a false apostle, as it were, by the side of Sergius Paulus. And Paul engages in a conflict with him, and uh, uh, that, that uh, false advisor is humbled, and Paul is exalted, and he wins the area of Sergius Paulus. That's happening throughout the, throughout, uh, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout the uh, mission areas of the early church. Uh, we think of the early church as being politically, uh, being, as being apolitical, as not being really concerned about who's ruling them, 
Uh, what in fact is happening in the book of Acts is that um, the, the Roman world is gradually coming under the dominion of the people of God. Uh, the uh, conversion of Constantine and the, and the conversion of the Roman Empire is simply the fulfillment. That establishment of Christendom is simply the fulfillment of the mission that started with the apostles. The apostles aimed from the beginning to pilot the Roman world, to pilot it into a new creation under Jesus Christ, the new, the new Noah, the chief pilot of his church.